Johnny Tremaine, Chapter 10, Disperse Ye Rebels The 14th of April, 1775, General Gage had sent out spies dressed as Yankee men looking for work. The spies came back on this day. All the colonels were at the province house with General Gage listening to their reports. Joseph Warren knew this, and so did Paul Revere, even Johnny Tremaine. It was easy enough to find out that spies had returned, were reporting to the commanding officer, but what had they reported? This was not known. The 15th of April, this fell upon Saturday. At every regimental headquarters, the same general orders were posted, signed by Gage himself. All the grenadier and light infantry companies were to be taken off duty until further orders. They were to be taught some new evolutions. Johnny himself read these orders posted in the lower hall at the Afric Queen. One man was grumbling, New evolutions, what was Grandma Gage thinking about? But Lieutenant Stranger, as he read, whistled and laughed. That, he said, looks like something at last. Each regiment had two companies picked and trained for special duty. The light infantry were the most active and cleverest men in each regiment. Lieutenant Stranger was a light infantry officer. These men were lightly armed and did scout and flanking work. In the grenadier companies, you found tall, brisk, powerful fellows, hard fighting men, always ready to attack. If you have 11 regiments and pick off from each of its two best companies, it adds up to about 700 men. All day, one could feel something was afoot. Johnny read it on Colonel Smith's florid face. He was stepping across the Queen's stable yard very briskly and remembering to pull in his pa- paunch. There was ardor in his eyes. Was it Marshal Ador? Lieutenant Stranger was so happy over something he gave Dove threepence. Spring had come unreasonably early this year. In the yard of the African Queen, peach trees were already in blossom. Stranger was so happy something was bound to happen. Over on the common, Johnny found Earl Percy's regiment unlimbering, polishing two canyons. The soldiers were forming a queue about a grindstone sharpening their bayonets. What of it? They were always doing things like that. Did all this mean something or nothing? He went to Mr. Revere's, whose wife told him to look for him at Dr. Warren's. The two friends sat in the surgery, making their plans and listening to reports that were coming from all directions. Seemingly, the excitement among the officers, the preparations among the soldiers had been noticed by at least a dozen others. But were they? But where were they going? Who would command them? No one knew. Possibly only Gage himself, although before the start was actually made, he would have to tell his officers. All that day, the British transports had been readying their landing boats. This meant, might mean men would be taken aboard move off down the coast, as Salem had been invaded two months before, or that they were standing by merely to ferry the men across the Charles River, land them in Charlestown or Cambridge. The work on the boats suggested that the men would not march out through the town gates, and yet Gage might have ordered this work done merely to confuse the people of Boston, blind them to his real direction. The talk of Dr. Warren's went on into the night. Johnny relaxed on a sofa in the surgery as the men talked. He was ready to run wherever sent found out any fact for them. Sorry, find out any fact for them. It was past midnight. He would not have known he had been asleep except that he had been dreaming. He had been hard at work down at Hancock's wharf boiling lobsters, he and John Hancock and Sam Adams. The lobsters had men's eyes with long lashes and squirmed and looked up piteously. Hancock would avert his sensitive face to their distress. Go away, please. But he kept pushing them under with his gold-headed cane. Sam Adams would rub his palms and chuckle. Johnny woke up and realized that only Revere and Warren were still in the room and they were talking about Hancock and Adams. These two gentlemen had left in Boston March. Had left Boston in March. They were representatives at the Provincial Congress at Concord. The British had forbidden the general court to meet, but the Massachusetts men had merely changed the name of their legislative body and gone on sitting. But did the British know that both these firebrands were staying at the Clarks out in Lexington? It will do no harm to warm them, Revere was saying, getting to his feet. I'll row over to Charleston tonight, go to Lexington, and tell them a sizable force may soon move. They had best hide themselves for the next few days. And get word to Concord, the cannons and stores had best be hidden, of course. Tell them we here in Boston have the situation well in hand. The second the troops move, either on foot or into those boats, we will send them warning in time to get the Minutemen into the field. I'd give a good deal to know which way they were going. But suppose none of us can get out. Gage knows we'd send word if we could. He may guard the town so well it will be impossible. 
Johnny was still half awake. He yawned and settled back to think of those lobsters with eyes like men, long lashes, tears on their lashes. Revere was pulling on his gloves. Colonel Conant in Charleston, I'll tell him to watch the spire of Christ Church. You can see in it well from Charleston. If the British go over the neck, we will show one lantern. If the boats, if in the boats, two, and come hell or high water, I'll do my best to get out and tell exactly what's acting. But I may get caught on my way over. Another man should also be ready to try to get out through the gates. They talked to various men and finally pitched upon Billy Dawes. He could impersonate anybody, from a British general to a drunken farmer. This might help him get through the gates. As Paul Revere, with Johnny at his heels, left Warren's a man emerged from the darkness, laid on, laid on, sorry, laid a hand on Revere's arm. In the little light, Johnny recognized the rolling black eye, poetic negligence of dress. It was Dr. Church. Paul, he whispered. What's afoot? Nothing, said Revere shortly and went on walking. The British preparing to march? Why don't you ask them? The queer man drifted away. Johnny was surprised that Revere would tell Church nothing, for he was in the very inner circle. Seemingly, Revere himself was surprised by a sudden caution. But I can't trust that fellow. Never have, never will. The 16th of April. All over Boston Bells were calling everyone to church. As though they had not a care in the world, the British officers crowded into the Episcopal churches and army chaplains held services for the soldiers in the barracks. Paul Revere was over on the mainland carrying out his mission. Boston looked so usual and so unconcerned. Johnny began to wonder if they all had not made mountains of molehills, imagine expedition when none was intended. But Rab was so certain the time was close at hand that he told Johnny that he himself was leaving Boston for good. There would be fighting before the week was out, and he intended to be in it. Now he must report at Lexington. Johnny took the news bad, this news badly. He could not endure that Rab should leave him, desert him. But as soon as the first shot is fired, no man of military age can possibly get out of Boston. They'll see to it. It's now or never. He did not seem to feel any grief at abandoning Johnny, who sat disconsolating, disconsolately on his bed watching Rab. The older boy was cutting himself a final piece of bread and cheese. How many hundreds of times Johnny had seen those strong white teeth tearing at coarse bread. Rab had been eating bread and cheese all through their first meeting, and that was long ago. It seemed he'd been eating bread and cheese to the end. There was a sick qualm at the pit of Johnny's stomach. He couldn't eat bread and cheese, and it irritated him that Rab could. The older boy was glowing with good health, good spirits. He was 18, six feet tall, and a grown man. He looked as if... He looked it as he moved about the low attic, stuffing his pockets with extra stockings, rolling up a shirt and a checkered and ha handkerchief. He is leaving me, and he doesn't care, thought Johnny. Perhaps I'll go too, he offered, hoping Rab would say, I'd give everything I've got, even my musket, if you could come, or merely, fine, come along. No, you can't, said Rab. You've got your work to do right here in town. You stick around with your fat friend Dove. Gosh, I'm glad I'll never have to listen to Dove again. But you'll have a fine time with Dove while I... You know I can't stomach Dove. No, I thought he he and you were getting on fine together. And there's not one reason why I can't leave for Lexington too, except you don't want me to. He knew this was not true, but he could not help badgering Rab, trying to make him say, I'll miss you as much as you'll miss me. Rab laughed at him. He was going to leave, and he wasn't going to be slopped over. Johnny was gazing at him sullenly. Rab took the extra stockings from his pocket, untied his handkerchief, and added to them to his shirt and other necessities. You want to go? Johnny accused him. Yes. Well, then go. I'm going fast. I'm able. Oh, Rab, Rab. Have you ever seen those little eyes at the end of the musket? Rab, don't you go. Don't you go. Rab was singing under his breath. It was the song of the Lincolnshire poacher that Mr. Revere had taught Johnny and Johnny had taught Rab. There was something about Rab singing low, a little husky, and not too accurate that always moved Johnny. It was a part of the, that secret fire which came out in fighting, taking chances, and dancing with girls. The excitement glowed in Rab's eyes now. He was going into danger. He was going to fight. And the thought made some dark part of him happy. Johnny wanted to tell him about those eyes, but instead he said, I guess you really want to get out to, to Lexington and do some more dancing. Here's hoping. From then on, Johnny said nothing, sitting glumly on his bed, his head bowed. Then Rab came over to him and put a hand on his shoulder. Goodbye, Johnny. I'm off. Johnny did not look up. You're a bold fellow, Johnny Tremaine. He was laughing. Johnny heard Rab's feet going down the ladder. The door of the shop closed after him. He ran to look out the window. Rab was standing outside the Lauren house shaking hands with his uncle, saying goodbye like a grown man. Now he was bending down to kiss Aunt Jennifer, 
not at all like a small boy kissing an ant. He picked up Rabbit, who could toddle about, and kissed him too. The half running, he passed slightly up Salt Lane and out of sight. One moment too late, Johnny ran out into the alley. He couldn't let Rab go like that. He had not even said, good luck, God be with you. Why? He might not ever see, he might not ever see Rab again. He went back to his garret and flung himself on his bed. He wished he might cry and was half glad he was too old for tears. Today there was no sound from the shops and wharves. No crying of chimney sweep, oyster men, knife grinder. The town was whist and still, for it was Sunday. As Johnny lay upon his bed, the church bells began to call for afternoon service. They babbled softly as one old friend to another. Christ Church and Cockerell, Old South, Old Meeting, Holly's King's Chapel. He knew everyone. He had heard them clanging fiercely for fire, crying fiercely to call out the Sons of Liberty. He had heard them toll for the dead, rejoice when some unpopular act had been repealed, and shudder with bronze rage at tyranny. They had wakened him in the morning and sent him to bed at night. But he never loved them more than on Lord's Day when their golden clamor seemed to open the blue vaults of heaven itself. You could almost see the angels bending down to earth, even to rowdy old Boston. Peace, peace, the soft bell said. We are at peace. Suddenly close by, over at the African Queen, the British drumsticks fell. The fife struck up, two, two, tootly two. Even on Sunday they were out drilling. So were other men, even on Sunday, for instance, over in Lexington. The 16th of April drew to a close. Monday was a quiet day. Lieutenant Stranger looked very solemn. Maybe there was not to be an expedition, after all. The 18th of April. By afternoon, the sergeants were going about the town, rounding up the grenadier and light infantry companies, telling them in whispers to report at moonrise at the bottom of the common, equipped for an expedition. The sergeants would tap their red noses with their fingers and bid the men by be whist. But it was common knowledge in the barracks and on the streets that 700 men would march that night. This very night, come darkness, the men would move. But in what direction? And who would be in charge of the expedition? Surely not more than one of the colonels would be sent. Johnny, who had his own colonel to watch, Colonel Smith, hardly left the African Queen all day and helped the pot boy serve drinks to the officers in the dining room. A young officer sitting with Stranger did say, as he stirred his brandy and water with his thumb, that he hoped before long thus to stir Yankee blood. And what of that? Colonel Smith did not did have an army chaplain to dine with him that day. Did that mean he was suddenly getting religious, as people are said to before they go into danger? Of of one thing, Johnny was sure. Dove knew much less than he did. Dove was so thick-witted he had no idea anything unusual was afoot. He honestly believed that the grenadiers and light infantry were merely going to be taught new evolutions, as usual. Dove was too wrapped in his own woes to think much of what was happening about him. By five, Johnny thought he would leave the Afric and sorry, leave the Queen and report to Paul Revere that he had discovered nothing new. First, one more glance at Dove. For once he found him hard at work, his lower lips stuck out, he woodish pig lashes, his woodish pig lashes wet. He was polishing a saddle. That guy, he complained, hit me for nothing. He said I was going to get to work on his campaign saddle. Who's he? Colonel Smith, of course. Did you do as he, as he told you? I tried. I didn't know he was, had two saddles, so I went to work on the usual one. I shined it until you can see your face in it. And he takes it out of my hands and hit me on the head with it. Says I'm a stupid loot. Lout to not know the difference between a parade saddle and a campaign saddle. How'd I know? Why? He's been over here about a year, and that campaign saddle hasn't been ever been unpacked. I had to get it from the lieutenant stranger. How'd I know? Johnny said nothing. He realized he had heard something which conceivably might be important. Careful, careful. Don't you say anything to scare him. Where's your polish? I'll help you with the stirrups. The instant Johnny went to work, Dove, as usual, lay back on the hay. One of the stirrups wrapped round my head. Cut my ear, it bled something fierce. Johnny was studying the saddle on his knees. It was of heavy black leather, brass, not silver mountings, three girths instead of two, all sorts of hooks and straps for attaching, map cases, spy glasses, flasks, kits of all sorts. Colonel Smith is going on a campaign, but perhaps not. He might merely be riding down to New York. He leaned back on his heels. Say, what if you and I took time to eat out to eat a supper? The Queen's cook has promised me a good dinner because I helped them. <clears throat> at table this afternoon. Roast goose, I'll fix it so you can get in on it too. Oh, for goodness sake, no. It's past five o'clock. Colonel can't be going anywhere tonight. Oh, for land's sake, Johnny, he says. I'm to show him that saddle by six sharp, and if he don't like it, it's look, he's going to cut me to mince meat. He is, he's always saying things like that. He's the 
Johnny did not listen to what Colonel Smith was. He was thinking. Well, after that, when Colonel Smith has settled down to play whist, can you get off? Tonight isn't like any other night. He told me to bring Sandy around for him, feed and clean, and saddle with this old campaign saddle by 8 o'clock tonight. Colonel Smith is going on a long journey, starting tonight at 8. It might be a campaign. He had an idea. I, th I should think if the colonel was making a long trip, he'd take Nan. She's so light and easy to ride if he has far to go. He does like her better. She does jounce his fat so. He always rides her around Boston, but only yesterday he had Lieutenant Stranger take her over to the common when the men were drilling. Stranger says she still is squirmy when she hears drums and shooting. I heard him say so. Oh, drums and shooting. This was not to be a peaceful ride to say New York. His cloth whipped over the black saddle leather. He spat on it and rubbed even harder. The one thing he must not say was the wrong thing. Nothing was better than the wrong thing. For a while, he said nothing. Saying as good as gold, but he's an old horse and a little stiff. His front leg, leg, his front left leg won't last forever. Colonel Smith didn't say he was going off on him forever. This did not help much, but Dev went on. He and the horse doctor and lieutenant stranger were all looking at him just this morning. The horse doctor said old Sandy could do 30 miles easy. And stranger said, no, he wouldn't swear you could get Nan on and off a boat without her fussing. So the campaign would start around 8 that night. The colonel's horse would be put on and off a boat. There would be a risk at least of drums and shooting. They were not going farther than 30 miles. Those men who thought the target of the expedition was going to be Lexington and Concord were right. And it would be Colonel Smith who would go in command. All Johnny's hidden excitement went into his polishing. The brass mountings turned to gold. The black leather to satin. There, you take that in and show your colonel. But he would wait one moment more. Dove might have something more to say when he came back after he had seen the colonel. Johnny went to Goblin's stall, but the horse pretended not to know him, and put back his ears and nipped at him. Sandy next. The big yellow horse carefully moved over to give him room in the stall. Nickered a little. He fondled the broad white striped face, pulled gently at the ears, little furry ears, lost in the mane like a pony's. I guess, Johnny said. It looks like you're, you'll be seeing that rab before I do, maybe in Lexington. You tell that rab he'd best look sharp, take good care of himself. Tell that rab... Oh, anything. Dev came back in a jubilee. Colonel says I've done a fine job, and so he's, and so quick he's going to give me tomorrow as a holiday. He don't expect to get back before night. Certainly, this campaign was going to be a short one if everything went as well, went as the British expected. It is tonight, all right, Johnny said to Doctor Warren, and Colonel Smith will be will command. He went on to tell what he had found out from Dove that the expedition would start tonight, and that Lexington and Concord were the likely likely objects the men sitting about and Warren's surgery had already guessed. But they were interested to learn that Colonel, and presumably his troops, expected to return to Boston the day after they set out and that he was to command them. Seemingly Gage, a punctilious man, had chosen Francis Smith because he had been in service longer than any of the other, and smarter colonels. Hark! Outside the closed window on the Trimmet Street, a small group of soldiers were marching stealthily toward the common. These were the first they heard, but soon another group marched past, then another. A man whose duty it was to watch the British boats at the foot of the common came in to say he had actually seen the men getting into the boats, heading for Cambridge. Dr. Warren turned to Johnny. Run to Ann Street. Bid Billy Dawes come to me here, ready to ride. Then go to North Square. I've got to talk to Paul Revere before he starts. Both he and Dawes will be expecting a messenger. Billy Dawes was in the kitchen. He was a homely, lanky young fellow with closed set eyes and a wide expressive mouth. He and his wife had dressed him for the part he would play, a drunken farmer. His wife, who looked more like a schoolgirl than a serious matron, could not look at him without going from one giggle fit to another. She laughed even more and Billy joined her. When Johnny came in and said the time had come, the young man st stuck a dilapidated hat with the broken feather on his head and his wife picked up a bottle of rum and poured it over the front of his torn jacket. Then she kissed him, and they both laughed. As he stood before them, his expression changed. His, his eyes went out of focus. His grin became foolish. He hiccuped. He hiccuped. He hiccuped and swayed. Sorry about that. He both looked and smelled like a drunken farmer, but he did have money in his pocket with no country blade would have had after a big toot in town. He knew one of the soldiers guarding the neck that night. He believed he'd get out all right. The scene in the Dawes' kitchen was so lighthearted and so comical, and Johnny as well, 
as little Miss, Mrs. Dawes laughed so hard he wondered if she had any idea of the risk her husband was running. For by any law or any land a man caught exiting to armed rebellion might be shot. Sorry, exciting. Um, exciting to armed rebellion might be shot. The second the door closed after the young man, Johnny knew. Mrs. Dawes stood where her husband had left her, all laughter wiped from her face. Billy Dawes was not the only gifted actor in his family. From Ann Street, Johnny ran toward North Square. This he found, in, found crowded with light infantry and grenadier companies, all in full battle dress. They got in his way, and he in theirs. One of the men swore and struck at him with his gun butt. The regulars were getting ugly. He could not get to the re to the <clears throat> the regulars were getting ugly. He could not get to the Revere's front door, but by climbing a few fences, he reached their kitchen door and knocked softly. Paul Revere was instantly outside in the dark with him. Johnny, he whispered, the Somerset has been moved into the mouth of Charles. Will you run to Copse Hill and tell me if they have moved in any of the other warships? I think I can row around one, but three or four might be might make me trouble. I'll go look. Wait, then go to Robert Newman. You know the Christchurch sexton. He lives with his mother opposite the church. I know. They have British officers billeted on them. Don't rap at the door. Take this stick. Walk by the house slowly, limping, tapping with the stick until the light and the upper window goes out. Then go round to the alley behind the house. Tell Newman the lanterns are to be hung now. Two of them. He knows what to do. As Johnny stood among the graves of lonely Copps Hill looking across the broad mouth of Charles, he could see lights in the houses of Charleston, and all over there he knew men were watching Boston, watching Christ's lofty spire, waiting for the signal. And as soon as they saw it, the best and the fastest horse of Charleston would be saddled and made ready for Paul Revere, who had himself promised to get over, if possible, ride and spread the alarm, summon the Minutemen. He watched the riding lights on the riding lights on the powerful 64-gun Somerset. The British had evidently thought her sufficient to be to prevent boats crossing the river that night. She was alone. The moon had risen. The tide was rising. The Somerset was winding at her anchor. The night was unearthly sweet. It smelled of land and of the sea, but most of all it smelled of spring. Salem Street, where the new men's lived, like North Square, was filled with soldiers. The redcoats were assembling here, getting ready to march down to the common, and they would be a little late. Their orders were to be ready by moonrise. A sergeant yelled at Johnny as he started to limp past them, but when he explained in a, in a pietous whine that his foot had been squashed by a blow from a soldier's musket, and all he wanted was to get home to his mama. An officer said the men were to let the child pass. Johnny was 16, but he could pull himself together and play at being a little boy still. Downstairs in the Newman house, he could look in and see a group of officers, as usual, almost as always playing at cards. Their jackets were unbuttoned, their faces flushed. They were laughing and drinking. There was on the second floor one light. Johnny couldn't believe anyone up there could hear him tapping in the street below. Instantly, the light went out. He had been heard. Newman, a sad-faced young man, got out a second-story window and back and ran across a shed roof and was in the alley waiting for Johnny. One or two, he whispered. Two. That was all. Robert Newman seemed to melt away in the dark. Johnny guessed what the little tinkle Johnny guessed what the little tinkle was he heard. Newman had the keys to Christ Church in his hands. The two friends, Paul Revere and Joseph Warren, were standing in the doctor's surgery. They were alone. Revere was urging Warren to cross with him that very night to Charlestown. If there was fighting tomorrow, Gage would not hesitate to hang him at last for high treason, but Warren said no. He would stay and keep track of the British plans until the very last moment. The second a shot has, has been fired, I'll send a messenger to you, Revere promised. I'll wait until then. Why, Revere? I never saw you worry about anything before. I'll be a lot safer tonight than you'll be. Catching crabs out out on the river, being short at, sorry, being short at by the Somerset and falling off horses. I'll not forget you and Parson Tomley's. Um, ambling jade he was all he was always raging revere about falling off horses it was some old joke between them and which johnny did not know and both the men suddenly began to laugh the mood between them had been heavy when johnny came in but now it lightened they parted as casual as any friends who believe they will meet in a few days but each knew the other was in a deadly peril of his life it was 10 o'clock Dr. Warren told his colored man to make up a bed for Johnny in the surgery. The boy could not think of bed. He stole down to the common to see the secret embarkation. It was almost over, and was no secret. Hundreds of townsfolk stood about silently watching the boats returning from Cambridge, shore and taking on yet another scarlet-coated cargo. But when these men were heading out, and who, sorry, 
But when these men were heading, and who commanded them, scarce a man in the crowd knew, except Johnny. Farther down the river he knew the Somerset was on guard. By now Paul Revere was in his boat, trying to steal around her in Charleston. The horse waited for him. He was Sandy Step. Sorry, he saw Sandy step into a boat with never a quiver. He recognized Lieutenant Stranger's own horse, and for a moment saw the young man's dark face in the moonlight. Being a horse minded boy, he noticed that there was a little trouble with a showy white horse built like Sandy, but much younger. This was Major Pitcairns. Were the Marines being sent as well as the Grenadiers and Light Infantry Companies? Or was the rough, genial, stout hearted old Major merely going along for the fun of it? At least he thought this observation important enough to report to Warren. Other spies had been bringing news of the embarkation. It had been noticed that Pitcairn was not in his usual tavern. He had been seen with civilian cape wrapped about him heading for the common. Doubtless he was going. Gage had sent him either because he knew he was a better officer than Colonel Smith or because he had a way with the Yankees. Everyone liked the pious, hard-swearing, good-tempered Major Pitcairn. A barmaid from Hull Street came in to say she had been watching the Somerset at just the time Bentley and Richardson were rowing Paul Revere to Charleston. Not a shot had been fired. It was also known that Billy Dawes had woven and bribed his inebriated, 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 there you go, sorry, bribed his inebriated way past the guards on the neck, and the horse he was leading and pretended to try to sell had not looked like much. A thin bony beast in a, bri in a bridle patched with rope, it was one of the fastest horses in Boston. Then Dr. Warren told Johnny to lie down and get some sleep. It was almost midnight. Johnny took off his jacket and boots rolled up in a blanket on the bed, and the black man had made for him. that the black on the bed the black man had made for him. The night before and the night before Sorry, the night before and the night before that he had been much upset over Rab's leaving. His thoughts had turned to the empty bed beside him. He had slept badly, although people were still about the surgery exchanging ideas, trying to guess what the future might be, he immediately fell asleep. It was dawn. He was alone in the surgery and still sleeping. But out in Lexington, on the village green, the first shot was fired. One shot, and then a volley. And Major Pitcairn was saying, Disperse, ye rebels! Ye villains, disperse! Why don't ye lay down your arms? The war had begun. It was the dawn of the 19th of April, but Johnny Tremaine still slept.